benefit to employers and why, why this is important to you and for your clients is, um, is lots of things actually. One of them is reduced wait time. So um, it can, as I said, it can take up to 18 months. Um, and we know from, um, from our experience and from studies that have been done that the longer that someone is goes without care, the worse they're going to get or they're certainly not going to get better. Um, they're usually, some of them are off on a disability claim and they're at home, you know, getting worse. And uh, we know in disability, um, if someone is off up to six months, um, you know, the chances of them going, going back to work get worse the longer it goes on. And after six months, it really drops off. So that, you know, the chances of them going back to work are, are getting much worse. They're, they may not ever go back. Um, also, it's around early intervention. The sooner you can get in there and start helping someone, um, the better. It, it, you know, get, hopefully, it's usually the combination of medication and you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever kind of therapy is required under those circumstances. Uh, those two usually uh, help people. And the good news is that um, people report, there's studies that show 80% of people that get the help that they need for mental health uh, get better. So 80% of people will get better if they get the help they need when they need it. So um, the faster someone can work with them, the better. It also influences a collaborative care model. And what I mean by that is just that um, the counselors and psychotherapists work hand in hand with family physicians. They work on the multidisciplinary teams that, that Kim referred to. And um, they, you know, so they don't, they're not out there working in isolation. They do, and collaborative care is the best kind of care for, for, for anyone, whether it's physical or mental health. It's when you have uh, several people working on behalf of the, uh, the patient to get them better. So, so they certainly work in that. Reduced absenteeism, and we're talking about casual days, short and long-term disability, any kind of absences, it does impact that as well, which is um, one of the main costs that employers have. You know, aside from drugs, it's absence and disability are some of the top two that they're, that they're concerned about, and it impacts their bottom line. Um, it would have a positive impact on presenteeism and may reduce drug spend. And I mean, it, it only makes sense because if someone's getting healthy, they're going to be getting better. And so they're going to be feeling better, they're going to be more productive, and um, they can hopefully um, get off, you know, and um, perhaps the medication a little sooner. Because they don't necessarily all have to stay on it forever. Um, so, you know, a lot of employers want to be recognized as the best employer and they want to be ahead of the curve and that kind of thing. So a lot of uh, consultants and brokers want to introduce them to things to, to enable them to do just that. Um, so introducing new mental health resources and providing a much more robust mental health solution is, is key. And, and one thing that keeps happening is um, that we see that's an issue is around um, counselors and psychotherapists are often included in EAP programs. You know, you've probably um, included EAP programs for your clients, which is a great thing. So, so the counselor, so the person can go see a psychotherapist, for example. Say they say they get three sessions or six sessions, whatever it is, under the plan, under the program, and they've started developing a relationship with that person. You know, they've they've really they've talked about all the issues. They've you know they've uh, gone into detail about what the problems are, and they started on a path treatment plan. To, to help that person uh, get better. So then, okay, so they've de they're done their, their six sessions or whatever it is, and then they want to use their health plan. So unfortunately, the counselors and psychotherapists are not included in the health plan. And so the, all the work that's been done so far kind of goes down, you know, goes out the window, and uh, they have to start fresh with somebody else. So this is what happens, because in the plan, it probably says psychologist as I said earlier, and you know, psychologists are maybe um, psychiatrists. It doesn't say counselors and psychotherapists. So the person cannot go and then submit a claim and get paid. So that's a problem, is that disconnection, you know, in the treatment. So um, this has a, you know, a positive impact on the bottom line anytime you're making your, your plan more uh, robust around mental health. So it's gonna help with that. So, so the reason we're here, I mean, the main, the bottom line, as I said a little earlier, is the access to care. It's really the opportunity here is to write into the plan, into the paramedical benefit itself, 
um, where it says psychologist, just put a comma and add in counselors and psychotherapists. So that when the person goes and they go see a psychotherapist, they get their uh, receipt, they fill out the claim form, they submit it, and then and then they can um, the person is going to get paid. Uh, right now what's happening is they either have to stop seeing the person that they have been seeing before, or they just choose some, like a, a psychotherapist or counselor they want to start seeing, but can't, because it's not in the plan. So they either can't see the person or they pay out of pocket, um, you know, which isn't a great situation. Um, so really that's the thing that we're, that we're here to talk to you about. Um, I've already mentioned about the EF, EAP programs. Um, there are EAP programs out there that include psychotherapists and counselors, and there are some that don't. So it would be great to include the ones, obviously, um, to expand the access to care, to include the ones that have them in there. And as I was saying, there's the problem of the disjoint care, care as well. So if we can get them in the, in the um, paramedical benefit, get them written into the plan, then the insurers will have to start adjudicating them. Now we are working with the CLHIA. We know it's, this is not a simple little thing um, necessarily. It can be, I mean, it, but we're coming out of from all angles. So we're working with the CLHIA right now. Uh, we've done several presentations and we're working on a joint um, uh, receipt that will be accepted by them, just a universal receipt that, that all the members of um, the CCPA will use and um, you'll be accepted. So we're, we're talking to the insurers, we're talking to the CLHIA, but we wanted to come in and talk to you today. Um, so there have been some great success stories. Yes? A few minutes ago, the government funding cutbacks. Yeah. So there's no support programs out there for citizens to leverage to get assistance with the 7150 recession. Or what's the government cut back? What does that mean? Well, you know, the government provides certain programs, and they so they provide funding. For, I know that they provide funding <laughs> for more um, resources for um, the Aboriginal community, for example. So they'll take a look at different um, different communities, different um, you know, um, up in the Northwest Territories. I think there's something there where they really see a lack of opportunities for resources. So it's more about resources and providing some resources. So there, you know, there's funny for different programs here and there. Um, you know, there's help for the veterans. Um, um, so there's different programs like that. But, can you sort of? Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of the access issue, the, the majority of life insurance companies, or health insurance companies, I should say, don't include counselors and psychotherapists in their plans. So they have some plans that do. We often face this. We have clients who approach us and say, well, under this particular group plan, counselors and psychotherapists are covered, but under this one, they, they, they aren't. You know? So there's no consistency across plans. So we're working with the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association on that to increase awareness. I know one of the challenges is that in the regulated provinces, different titles are used. So Nova Scotia uses the term registered counseling therapist. So any of you clients in Nova Scotia, they're accessing services of a counselor, that's who they're accessing, RCTs. In New Brunswick, it's licensed counseling therapist, so LCT. In Ontario, it is registered psychotherapist, so RP. You might be more familiar with that one. I know a lot of you folks are from Ontario. And in Quebec, it's the psychotherapy permit. So you can be able to uh, belong to a variety of different colleges or orders, as they call them in Quebec. And if you have the psychotherapy permit, this uh, provides you with the ability to, to practice. And then, of course, in the unregulated provinces, our designation, Canadian Certified Counselor. So I'm not meaning to confuse folks with that, but I think it's an important message that there are different titles. And that's why in our advocacy message, we talk about counselors and psychotherapists in general, knowing that there are different titles depending on the province that you're working in. But uh, we did have that that target from you know, you know target from the government, and now it was that. But yeah, there is there, there was more money um, set out, but they, they didn't uh, describe what it was going to be used for. Just mental health. So, and I I'm sorry I don't recall the the exact figure before, but um, it it has been cut back. So they they say you know they'll in this bucket of mental health 
in their budget, they'll they'll say uh, we have we're going to uh, put this much you know available for certain programs, and they'll identify those programs later. It could be that certain organizations apply, you know, for some of that funding, you know, and then it, and then it goes to them, and then they may earmark some for you know some programs they want to put forward around mental health. So, but that hasn't come back. There still is funding, but it's been lowered. Okay, and I'll keep the funding going. No. No, it's not covered by OHIP, no. OHIP covers psychiatrists and physicians, yeah. not psychologists, not counselors, not psychotherapists. Psych psychologists, yeah. no, no. I think, uh, and I'm worried, you know, not challenge, not challenge anything you put up on the slide. Either the dining building, it makes sense, you would help someone with mental illness, your costs are going to drop. Uh, you're, you're pitching to CLHIA, uh, which is good, which are in charge of it, but they don't pay the bills. No, no. The issue you, you have is you've got to put some credible data that mm -hmm. you can make a business case out of for the people that are paying. Yeah. Okay, um, it doesn't matter. I mean, we can get an insurance company, or every insurance company to write this in. That's not an issue. It's who's paying for it. Yeah. And it comes down to the employer level. and. Uh, they all want to do everything for their employees, but sure. they got a budget. So if you can come up with positive data yeah. that can help us, you're, you're quoting some things here. Yeah. You'll see the data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there is, there, there is a lot of information out there in studies that show that if you put in workplace mental health solutions, um, that you know, you're going to get a return on investment of, I mean, more than should probably put it way up to like 20 and 22 percent. Typically around three or four. But there's no data around to prove it to an employer. That's why everybody's staying away from it. They need the data. You've got two companies up there, one being a major insurance company. Yeah. They see the study so, that they yeah. did to do that, and that's where you're going to make headway. Yeah. You're not going to make headway with insure, uh, out there other than putting the people that are paying the bill. Yeah, no, I hear you. So I am having a conversation with Manuel. Like, yeah, so Manuel I've introduced, they expanded their benefit. They expanded it in a number of ways, so we can't say it's all because of this. Um, they went from, what was it, $1,000 to $10,000 um, uh, for mental health um, for their employees and their families. And um, uh, so it was a huge jump. So they really increased the benefit amount. They also included um, access to different mental health professionals, including the uh, counselors and psychotherapists. So, and not anecdotally, they, they have like, been in discussions with them, trying to get just at that, because you're right, I mean, we need to be able to help people. So um, they said, of course, the paramedical spend went way up. You would, you would imagine that. They, they expanded it all the way to 10 grand. Um, so, but, they really see this as a success because their disability has gone down. Their absence of disability have gone way down. The costs associated with that have gone way down. And so they're, they're saying that this is a very successful program. They're going to keep doing it. Now I have a conversation booked for November 14th with the physician, their, their um, doctor there, that um, is, is responsible for these programs so that I can delve into it a bit more. Because I, I know what you're saying. We need to be able to say, well, what impact is it going to have to the plan? You know, and, and how can you prove some of this stuff? So, I mean, there's a lot of studies out there with data that show that show ROI generally around mental health, putting in mental health solutions uh, for employers. Um, so we are, you know, talking about those, but we're trying to delve into what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kim referred to the fact that if, if you're approving a counselor, they have to have a master's degree. You can have a master's degree in a lot of things. Why do they need a master's degree? So for our designation, you have to have a master's degree in counseling or related field. So we have a registrar that does an in-depth assessment of the application. So you have to have that degree from a Canadian recognized degree granting institution or an American uh, institution, again, that's, that's recognized in the States. We also do international assessments, but it has to be in the counseling field, and we've actually identified the comprehensive program they have to follow. So we say they have to do a skills course, they have to do an ethics course, they have to do a theories course. We list the different electives that they have to do. So it is very specific to counseling as opposed to a master's degree in an unrelated field. Yep. Not psychotherapy or typically they would be um, it could be a master of arts degree, it could be a master of education, uh, psychology, social sciences. It, it really it depends on the university. And again, there's 
different. Back to the title, 